Hey, welcome back. This is an update on the USB programmable power supply project. So in the first video, we were talking about the first stage, which was the power factor correction with a boost converter. In this video, we're going to look at the second stage, which is stepping the voltage back down to the variable output. We're going to go over the design specifications and then look at a bunch of different topologies that we could pick. And I'll talk about which one I picked and why, and then look at some components and see which components I've selected for the main switch controller and some of the other main ones as well as what components we need to select going forward and then look at the next steps for this project. So here's the design specs we're looking for. We're getting 400 volts in from the first stage and on the output we want somewhere in the 0 to 150 volt range and the output current 0 to 3 amps doesn't have to be 3 at 150 volts, but at low voltages we want up to 3 amps. Output power around 100 watts, and we want a fast and adjustable transient response. We also want an isolated output, so we're going to be looking at isolated topologies. Here I've listed a bunch of isolated topologies. These are most of the common ones. So the first one I have here is a flyback. And this one is for lower powered stuff. We could use it, but I think we're going to just eliminate it right off the bat because we want to do a little bit higher power. And then the next one is the forward, which is an isolated buck converter. And that one stands out as something that is uh, probably what we want because we're trying to step the voltage down, but we also want it to be isolated. So the buck converter steps the voltage down and the forward is the isolated version of that. The next ones here, these are all variants of the forward converter. The T-switch, the voltage clamp, the push-pull, the half bridge, and the full bridge. And this last one here, resonant LLC. So there's a lot of different resonant topologies, but the LLC is the most common one. And the thing with that is resonance uh, really are super high efficiency if you have a super constant load. So you want to tune the resonant converter to output a constant power and you can get it really efficient. But we're going to um, not select that one because we want a variable output and the resonant is fairly complicated and we aren't that worried about efficiency. Now that we've eliminated the flyback and the resonant converter, we can zoom in on these different forward topologies and narrow it down. So I've got a table here with some of the prominent parameters to consider. And the first one is the power level. So you can see these on the left are medium power, these on the right are high power. And that's also lining up with this row, which is the transformer utilization. So the low power ones are pulsing kind of like one pulse into the transformer and then resetting the transformer on the second half whereas these ones, they're pulsing back and forth every time pumping power through the transformer. So they're a little bit uh, more efficient, like twice as efficient as these at using the transformer. So then the other thing is a high side FET. If you have a high side FET, it's a little more complicated because you either need a PFET, which is less efficient, or if you use an infet, you need a high side driver and a voltage that's higher than the input voltage. So then the next thing to consider, which is a big one, is this FET voltage. And the voltage across the FET for these are either one or two times the input voltage. Now our input voltage is 400 volts, so it's really large. And that uh, basically eliminates the ones that are two times because we would need, for margin, at least 900 volts, 1,000 volts, and that's going to be a pretty gnarly fit. So we can narrow it down to this two-switch forward, and then the voltage clamp, or the half bridge, or the full bridge. Now looking at the power levels, these are a little more complicated, and therefore much higher powers, like kilowatts. Oh, what we're doing is 100 watts, so we can get rid of those and just look at the two switch forward and the voltage clamp. And there's not a super good reason to choose either one of these. Um, I think we're just going to go for no particular reason with the two switch forward for this design.
This just shows the classic forward converter and the T-switch forward, so we can talk about how those work real quick and compare and contrast them. The classic forward has the primary winding coming down here through the main FET, and when the FET turns on, current flows like this and like this through the output through the diode and into this load and this filter capacitor. When the switch turns off, the field that's built up in here in the magnetizing inductance of this core has to collapse and it can't go anywhere with just this coil. So you have to add this other coil here to let that field reset. So the current then goes through this here and gets pumped back to the input, which helps not waste it. In the two switch forward, what we're doing is we're getting rid of that reset coil and replacing it with an extra FET and an extra diode. So here you see to get the current flowing through the main transformer, you have to turn both of these FETs on at the same time. Then the current flows through here and through the output. Then when you turn off the FETs in this transformer needs to reset. It resets through the primary winding through these diodes here. So it, when it flips, then the current flows through here and back up here. And that's real nice because it clamps the voltage to the input. So the FETs never see more than the input voltage across them and neither do the diodes. One note for both of these is because you need to reset the winding, you need to give it some off time. And the way to guarantee that is just to limit the duty cycle to 50%. So for both of these, in our controls, we're going to want to make sure we clamp the maximum duty cycle at 50%. So here's a little more detailed schematic of the T-switch forward converter. I just got this out of the Ridley Works design software. So this here is what we were looking at before, the power stage. And then for the controls, we're going to have to pull off of the output here and have some kind of an error amplifier. We're going to use this kind of version of the 431 or 1431, which is a error amplifier combined with a voltage reference and a feedback, optical feedback, this optocoupler. Then we'll have a secondary amplifier here before it goes into the PWM control chip. Now the tricky part that I haven't figured out fully yet is how are we going to adjust the output voltage? Because the best way to do that would be to vary this resistor here or vary this reference voltage here. But those are on the output side. And the microcontroller I was thinking was going to be on the input side. So we'll have to figure that out. Another thing is we could use the microcontroller that does the USB to also act as this PWM chip, but that's a little risky. I think we definitely want to design it with the analog controller first, and then we can try upgrading it later and see if that works. But we'll have to think about that some more and figure out how to do that. If we can get some kind of a variable resistor that's digitally controlled or control this voltage source here or come up with a scheme where we're using the optocoupler feedback to adjust this. Now digging into the components, let's start with the PWM control chip. So we don't need anything fancy. We are going to control both switches at the same time. So we just need one output pulse. So we're going to go with this classic here. This is the UC18 series. Um, this is a Unitrode. It got bought by Texas Instrument. They have high reliability versions of this too, used in a lot of aerospace stuff. So if you look at the different versions, they have a table here. For the, 
if it starts with a one, it's got this high temperature range. Uh, the two and the three are a lower temperature range. So we'll use the one since that's the most reliable. And then they have 42, 43, 44, and 45. So we're going to go with the one that has the high voltage here because we have a very high voltage input. And we're also going to go with the one that's clamped to 50%. So that puts us here, the 1844. So next for a driver circuit, we need something that does a high side drive. And I've looked at a few different application notes and come across this chip here, the UCC27714. And this is pretty cool. It operates up to 600 volts, so we're operating at 400 volts. This will be just fine. And it also has a built-in sort of system for doing a bootstrap to power the high side FET. It's not totally simple and straightforward, but it's easier than having a separate power supply for it. So here on page 23, figure 49, they show how to hook this up for a T-switch forward converter. We're just going to copy this schematic. Uh, the unfortunate thing is you have to add these two FETs in here to get this bootstrap to work for the high side driver. Uh, I think it might kind of work without it, but I guess it's a little bit iffy. So we could try removing them and see how it works, but I think we'll definitely design it with them in here. And that is a little bit of a bummer because if you're going to use for FETs, then you almost might as well do the full bridge version of this. But for that, you'd need a whole nother driving circuit, so it would still make it more complicated. So we'll keep the T-switch for now. So the speed strap's a tiny bit confusing. You have to stare at it for a little bit. But what you're basically doing is putting a capacitor between the source here and the gate driver of this FET. And then when this line here goes down to ground, you're filling up that capacitor through this diode with your regular bias supply. So if this is 15 volts, then you'll fill up this capacitor to 15 volts while this is low. And then this capacitor kind of keeps this little 15 volts higher than the source here, always, that can be used as the driving signal for the FET. So for that to work, you have to make sure that it goes down to zero fairly often to fill up the capacitor. And that's what these other two switches are for. And I think the simplest way to think about how these two switches work is that this switch here keeps this switch off while the main switches are on. So when the main switches are on and the power is conducting through here, these guys aren't doing anything. Then after these both switch off, this one here turns off and that allows this one here to turn on. And when this one turns on, then it pulls this node to ground. So it makes sure that every time everything is off, you get this boot capacitor here pulled down to ground so it can charge. So the next part is this 1431. This is another text instrument part. And it is a voltage reference combined with a sort of an amplifier. But the cool thing about it is it's powered, doesn't have a separate power rail. So it's powered by the circuit itself. So it's a three terminal device, which is really handy. And the way it works is it provides this voltage reference here which we're going to connect to the voltage divider that gives the uh, measurement off of the output. And then this output of it is going to control the voltage that we're feeding back through the optocoupler. And then between these two points is where we can set up our compensation for the control loop, like our type 2 with a uh, capacitor and a resistor in series with the capacitor. So next we have the main MOSFET. And this one here is a 
one that I found on an app note that looked pretty good, 600 volts, so it's got plenty of margin above the 400. It says that it's designed here for switch mode power supplies, and it's got some extra things inside of it. It's got a um, extra diode in parallel with the body diode, and it has this Zener protection on it so that it doesn't get uh, hurt by spikes. Here is the diode. I'm gonna try a silicon carbide shock key diode. So these guys are pretty crazy. Zero reverse recovery. So it's rated for 600 volts. The package has this back uh, part that will connect, which is gonna be harder for hand soldering, but it will be good for thermal dissipation. Next we have this power supply. This I think we'll just use as the lazy way to power all the control circuitry. It's like six bucks and you can give it 400 volts input and it'll put out 15 volts. They have them for five, 12, 15, and 24 volts, I think. The next thing I wanted to show was a few of the application notes that I used in learning about this stuff. This one's a 200 watt one from Infineon with the two switch forward. And they've got some stuff here, this demo board, and they've got a lot of different part numbers to check out for the different parts. This one here, they show it's using actually a combined controller that controls the input boost and the output to switch forward converter. So that's kind of cool. The next one here is this one called Power Conversion Design Guide. And on page 20, there's the two switch transistor forward converter and they've got some different um, recommendations for transistor selection, rectifier selection, and then they have it for a lot of different topologies too. So these are a lot of older parts, but it's still interesting. And the last one here is the on semiconductor T-switch forward current mode converter. And this one, is exactly what we're doing, the 400 volts input. These are all fixed output voltages. That's the thing that we can't just copy and paste, unfortunately. They have this drawing of their demo board on page 20, and it's got some part numbers to check out for recommendations on stuff. And you can see they're using the 431 as well. And they have their feedback coming back here and then their compensation here and their optocoupler. So the next steps here we need to figure out how to do the controllable feedback, how we're going to connect in the microcontroller. Then we need to pick the rest of the main parts here. We need the transformer, the output diodes, output inductor, output capacitors, optocoupler, and the primary feedback op amp. So this is not the 1431, this is on the uh, primary side. Then we need to draw the rough circuit in Circuit Studio and uh, figure out how we're going to do the transient response time. So what I'm thinking at this point is maybe we'll just double this circuit. We'll just do two of them so we can set two different voltages and then have a little switch kind of thing where you can switch between the two real fast and that'll be our fast transient. So that's it for today. Thanks for watching. Um, I did want to take a quick poll if you don't mind. I'm trying to decide if I should do this blue background or if I should do the green screen and just erase the background so it's a little easier to see the presentation behind me. So that would look like this. Boom! And then I could uh, have the presentation more like this, I guess, and wouldn't be hiding as much stuff, but I don't know if it's kind of weird just floating here. So let me know what you think, and I'll see you next time.